Welcome to Dialogue Choices Podcast. We'll be your inline and entertainment. Inline, inline entertain. God damn it. Online. It's online. In, Keith, it's supposed to be in, in flight entertainment because I'm oh, so clever no and I was doing a bit and then I was like, ha, inline ah. skates. Am I right? Or whatever the fuck I said instead. <laughs> <laughs> fuck it. Who cares? Everything's dead. Comedy is dead. YouTube is dead. I'm done. Is YouTube dead? What I'm gonna start to this oh, episode did? self promo. Fuck you. Uh, oh, <laughs> my Patreon has a new five dollar tier. Go on it. The end. No, the uh, I <laughs> lost my entire train of thought. with inline. I'm so distracted. By we that we, we were now. so organized three <laughs> minutes ago. I was and late to this podcast because I was mentally organizing it in the in the shower, and then I'm just like, I just lost my thread completely. But I uh, so. I tried to update my Patreon. I added a $5 tier because previously I had a $1 and a $15 tier. And that's that's like too big of a leap with nothing in between for people to go to. But I didn't want to add anything without being able to uh, actually like give something. But, I didn't ha but it was hard to figure out how to give something for that tier without just massively increasing my workload. But I've kind of found a solution, which is that I'm giving people early access to videos. And I was worried about doing that for the essay channel because I didn't think I'd reliably have like a monthly thing to give early access to but if i work in the let's plays at the same time then i can have a situation where like whatever i record that week i can find some way to give it to uh patreon immediately ish and then it comes out eventually on um, according to how the schedule works with every series having like two to four videos a week and all that and that being a much longer process so what that means in practical terms is that firmament the new game from people that made abduction and and mist came out and at this moment that I'm speaking, there's one episode out so far on on YouTube, but all eight episodes, its full run is all available on uh, Patreon immediately. So you can go watch all of it right now on Patreon, and or you can wait all month to watch it one by one. And I don't know, some some people could see this as like a cynical like you're withholding stuff to make money, but I'm like it's literally this. It is literally the same release schedule that has always existed for YouTube. It's just I've created a second way of accessing videos in the separate way that supports the channel that mostly doesn't change my workflow, although it does it does lead to an awkward thing where I don't I'm not necessarily changing my recording schedule, but I am having to change like my I have to I have to logistically figure out this is like behind the scenes YouTube shit. I have to figure out how to actually provide these videos which is a thing I've had multiple solutions for so far. Because the first thing I did was me and Toaster did recorded all of Arches, but then Steffi and I finished TJ's Route of Echo, so we're like, oh crap, Arches is not going to air for like at least a month, basically. This should be a Patreon perk, which is like the inciting incident for this whole thing. And at, for that one, I just took the, the regular videos that will be up later and just put them in a playlist unlisted and was like, here you go, Patreon, here's access to these unlisted videos. But that creates a logistical problem later on where I'm like, okay, these videos do eventually need to go live. And the frustrating thing about YouTube is that you cannot have an unlisted scheduled video. The set the the options for a video on YouTube are public, private, unlisted, and scheduled. And those are there's no like like variation within that and scheduled is functionally private but it will become public at the specific time that you've specified and unlisted is the state that you need in order to be able to make a video not publicly findable on youtube but if they have a link they can watch it which is how like patreon perks work is you make a private like people who pay only post on patreon and then link that video in that post because patreon does not have its own video hosting uh and then that link is how people access the video. Uh, <clears throat> so that creates a problem where if you're gonna try to make it public later, within the case of Arches, you then have to like make the series private again to then schedule it, which creates its own problem because then it's no longer like, available early to patrons at that point. So one of my solutions is like, my, my intermediate solution was what I did with Zelda, which is that I, I streamed like the first 11 hours of Breath of the uh, uh, Tears of the Kingdom and then I'm like, okay, I'll I'll give Patreon the stream VOD links, which is a separate video from the eventual videos that I'll be making out of this stuff. So that's like, it has a little bit of bonus behind the scenes, like in between the episodes things. And also this will stay uh, public uh, even after I start, even after I'm scheduling the video. So it doesn't create like a logistical problem for me. 
But then that's the issue where like the stream vods are worse. So now I'm like now I'm on the, the a third iteration already in only like two weeks. Where with Firmament, I uh, I rendered the individual hour long episodes and scheduled those for the next month. But then also rendered the entire playthrough in two four hour chunks as I progressed through the, the two sessions of playing through the game. And then upload those separately for Patreon. <laughs> so this is the, <laughs> so this, so there's the marathon videos that are private forever that I can link on Patreon, and there's this, and then there's the hour long normal videos that I can schedule normally for YouTube, which is not more recording work or and not that much more editing work, but it is like this weird logistical mess of rendering twice as much and uploading twice as much. So I'm not, I'm not in love with the solution either, but. That's been my workflow at the moment. But for Patreon, if can you want to hop on Patreon, um, though, you can watch all of Arches. You can watch uh, all of well, all of Arches except for the, the epilogue because it's not the, the that part of the video game is not up, uh, open to the public yet. So I'm not going to leak it until it's out to everybody on their end. Uh, you can watch all of Firmament. You can watch the first 11 hours of, of Tears of the Kingdom right now. And so my next project is to give you guys... Uh, the entirety of fear and hunger as fast as possible which i also recorded all of with toaster and maybe we'll talk about later but that game exists and is wild <laughs> and that's anyway that's my this is the first and probably last time i'll talk about this tier on the podcast but as somebody who's been coming out as gay for the last 10 uh, for the last year every week because of how it's so hard to actually spread information to your audience on YouTube. I got to cover all my bases and just put this shit everywhere. <laughs> so now it's on the podcast too. Anyway, how's everybody doing this week? I'm What's doing what, well. I, that's not how. That's not what we talk about in this podcast. About how everybody. <laughs> we don't talk about ourselves. <laughs> we don't check in on each other and how each other are feeling. Don't pivot, Fuck don't you. Pivot to that. How dare you? <laughs> uh, frankly, I'm about... calling the police. Let's talk about how Tears of the Kingdom is only one skill, and it's very big disappointment. <coughs> is it? Is it? A dis, is it a big disappointment? Is that what it is? I, I don't know. I didn't play it, uh. so it's you to, to talk about it. Uh, um, Toaster, say, uh, Toaster has Kingdom. preemptively vetoed all Tears of the Kingdom discourse. He's it's traumatic oh. for him. He, did, he, 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 not, he desperately <laughs> does not want to be exposed to Tears of the just, Kingdom discussions. I need, I need oh, one throat. place on the internet that isn't losing their minds over how the new zelda game is the best game ever and the only game to ever do anything that it does and nothing that it does has ever been done before uh, <laughs> that happens every time it does happen every time and it's it's str it stresses me out every single time too uh this is not me shitting on tears of the kingdom i am sure tears of the kingdom is fine but uh, yeah, it's just I, I lived through the trenches, the war torn trenches of Breath of the Wild where I played it and I was like, this game's pretty cool. It's my third favorite Zelda <laughs> game. I like I like that shrines take Zelda game design and and, and ex extrude them into these tiny five minute sections. It's kind of a barren open world, but it's neat that stuff like interacts. I wish there were more high level rewards instead of going out of my way to explore something and getting a chest full of arrows. And then I look online and people are like, this is the greatest open world I've ever played. Nintendo finally solves open worlds. Uh, no other open world has ever been this dense. And I'm like, bruh, what are but, you oh, talking about? Uh, is that why they so, solved open worlds? Because it's that's dense. apparently <laughs> it's apparently just the best open world with the most stuff to do. Um, and anyway, long story short, uh, I love oh, Breath of the Wild. I think it's a great game. I'm sure I'll like Tears of the Kingdom eventually when I play it. But like, I can't I just can't do it right now. I can't I can't <laughs> look peer into the bizarro land that is Nintendo fans and their <laughs> extraordinarily small sample size of video games they compared to. Poster's been uh, seething so seething and molding every time that I call Breath of the Wild my favorite open world game. That's no, how, yeah. Uh, and I'm not even no, a Nintendo I fan. I hadn't even played Zelda games at that point. <laughs> it was literally <laughs> no, just like, I hang on a minute. I'm I not think there's tired a very... and frustrated <laughs> and like <laughs> instantly it, exhausted it, when I look at this world. It's full of things I that found I found think in my curiosity. A very very big difference between saying Breath of the Wild is your favorite open world 
and saying Breath of the Wild is the only good open world. And especially when your sample size uh, is I like mean, it's not, it can't be Breath the only of good the open Wild because pathologic and GTA. exists. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and Outer I'm Wilds, saying, right? And Outer Wilds, sure, exactly. Outer um, Wilds is technically open world. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is. It's, it's an open hub is the game. best way to describe I'm it. No, you dummy, that. you leave the world. It can't be open world if you leave <laughs> it. No spoilers. I, I, no spoilers. <laughs> spoilers and that it's a space game where you hop between it's planets. Space game. Wow. <laughs> spoilers of like the first 10 minutes of the game. I'm sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Not 10 minutes. You need to spend an hour and a half reading everybody's dialogue. How are you Come spending on. an hour? I'm out of there. I speed run. I just oh, ran out so of good. there. Get everybody's away, you so weirdo nice. aliens. Get me in the car. I'm gone. So Bye. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but let me let me pick your brain though, Keith. You you, you say you know this is known. You're famous to be to to I'm famous. Be famous for that, for that yeah, for the fact that the Breath of the Wild is your favorite open world game. But is it because it's very dense? Is that the reason? What do you mean by dense? I mean it in the sense of um, how do you because the way the way Toaster said it uh, in, in his example of Nintendo fans. Uh, of, uh, quote, Nintendo finally solves open world. It's so dense. Mm -hmm. It makes it sound as if the trick to an open world game, to make it good, is to make it dense. Uh, And honestly, I think, and and, and the reason why I kind of want to pivot on this this sort of topic, I think that's not really how people even perceive open worlds, about how dense they are. Uh, it, like maybe that maybe you know maybe they will say it and oh I like this one because it's dense but then when you actually look at it it's not necessarily more dense than others yeah uh, so like exactly that, I don't it, value like, open world games based on how much stuff there is to do mm-hmm. I don't think that's important uh, by which I mean like I don't think like the value of a game comes from its duration of its content like mm-hmm. how much it can consume your life or whatever like I like for me, Portal as a as a tight little ninety minute game that I've played eight times is fantastic. Like I don't really care about how long a game is. For me, what made yeah. Breath of the Wild really interesting is that I played. So I was there in, in the olden days. We would play GTA three when it was new and Vice City, mm-hmm. and like so I, I I experienced the like childhood little joy of of a sandbox where you're like huh, what's the story anyway shoot everything run things over with your car flip it over explode use the cheats to spawn a tank five star wanted level blah 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 and like I experienced that in all of its permutations for a while and then I was like okay the whole yeah cause mayhem in a gta world is amusing for a few minutes and that is one of the appeals of playing gta 5 online in in a unstructured form is just to be like you can just kind of screw around with your friends and just like get up to physics based shenanigans for a bit but mostly the whole oh you're beating up hookers oh this is so scandalous kind of like wore thin and i kind of stopped caring about the sandbox element of open world games and most of them mm-hmm. don't really foster that in any real way and then the uh the scourge happened to open world games and yep. i was and i was and i got sucked into it at the, the time. scourge known as far cry 3 i was gonna say assassin's <laughs> oh, creed one assassin's but creed yeah two. oh a one even two a one so, didn't have markers on the map the so, second one had you could you had, yeah you, you could have yeah. it back, yeah. but back I mean, in the day both are like, ubisoft Back in the day, I played Assassin's yep. Creed, and it was first. At first, it was like this kind of new, enthralling, like cool experience because you're playing as Altair, and you can freely climb all the buildings. You're like, this is a and whole new way of interacting good. with these settings compared to like GTA, where you were so specific in yep. what you were able to do. So it felt like incredibly freeing. So I was so hooked to Assassin's Creed because of like how good traversal and stuff did feel that I kind of didn't really clock that hard how like insubstantial the actual content was in that game like the campaign is paper thin and not very interesting and it's in like if you look at the assassinations they do not hold up to like no as much as they tried to claim there was freedom and variety they did they don't hold a candle to like hitman or anything like that 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 was already out yeah yeah. so they were kind of they they weren't that good but but nonetheless i sat there and i got all 460 collectibles like a fucking madman mm-hmm. where there's 40 of them in the training facility for the uh, the home base of the assassins there was 100 in the open world 100 in each of the three cities and then there was 20 templars that were unique throughout the world and like i did yep. all of it 
Ah, including that one weird one in the ruins in the open world that requires special jump tech you never had to learn at any point until then. Oh, and I you're remember like, that one. Yeah, yeah. That, you're like, wait, yeah, there's I, a way I to jump like well, kind yeah. of higher, and I've never needed to know that. Why is this coming up now? And yeah. I, I, and I 100%. I, I didn't even stop there. I 100% completed Assassin's Creed 2, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, Assassin's Creed Revelations single player component. Every single achievement That's up until much, then. <laughs> then, then, well, then Assassin's Creed 3 broke me, where I'm just like, this is so fucking boring. I cannot handle. That's where I fell off too. Yeah, I cannot handle oh, more the, I, slowly I, following wow. a guy this close, but not too close, while using bushes and benches in the same way I've done hundreds of hours now. I'm like, they need like there, so there's such a lack. There was such a lack of innovation. And a lack of any steps yeah, made forward true. beyond what they originally did with the first game, like they had, they got better cutscenes and and stuff like that, but they never got better game design, and that's incredibly disappointing. Yeah. To the point where yeah, when I yeah. played Revelations, I got the tutorial for the bombs, and then skipped it, and beat the game without <laughs> bombs, and then one hundred percent completed the game without bombs. I don't know how the bombs work in that game. It clearly it didn't matter because the game wasn't built around no. them because I didn't use them. Yeah, they're and, it, and I never they're felt like I needed useless. them. Uh, yeah. So like it's just the franchise just it was just it's just like a it, this this what happens is is a <clears throat> Ubisoft saw a profit motive and then the industry yes. as a whole saw a profit motive of of replicating Far Cry and Assassin's Creed which are basically the same game except one of them's shooting but there and has a uh, and one of them has like a this like edgy like villain centered uh, narrative structure but uh, they both are the same gameplay loop like identically and frustratingly. And like, yeah, like I, years later, I popped into Assassin's Creed Unity, the infamously bad one, but like you pop into it and they just fill the map with 500 icons of all the things you should be doing. And it's like the exact opposite of like hunting for flags in the original game. Uh, it's just, here's your endless checklist. And then every time anyone, ever, there's ever buzz about a big, cool open world game like Ghost of Tsushima. It's just the same thing again. We're like, okay, here's a giant world that's utterly uninteractive. There's nothing to do in it, nothing to discover. And then just dippled all, dop, dippled, doppled all over the whole damn map is five tasks, 30 times each. And it's like, oh, wow, yes. I mean, I'm following this fox to his shrine. Look at him go. Do it 50 more times for completion. And it's like, no, that's depressing. <laughs> like... So like yeah. I, I did I never felt anything new in an open world game until like debatably Pathologic Two, which is a bit of a questionable inclusion along because it's a it's like the Pathologic is alongside like Dead Rising as far as whether or not you call it open world. Yeah, it's, it is it's like an, it's a kind of sim structure, immersive yeah. sim kind of like you have a set amount of ways you can interact with the world, but like the the world goes on yeah. without you, but it's not really built around a sandbox really like for me the the gold standard for games that actually started doing something that felt different was uh death stranding and breath of the wild and death stranding is a little different in that it's it was less that they did away with the here's your series of tasks on the map thing and more that they fundamentally recontextualized via both gameplay and narrative and like the social aspects what <laughs> doing those tasks meant and they and then very much changed that gameplay loop and made it feel feel very interesting in a very different way. But what Breath of the Wild yeah. did was they gave you one waypoint. Look at that giant floating castle over there. That's where the Ganon is. You can go do it if you want. And you can. You can just go straight there and you can just go beat Ganon if you want to. Or you can go to all these different places and power up and, you know, play Zelda and do the dungeons and everything and get all your and get your powers and then go fight them the normalish way. But all along that adventure, it's just infinite optional content, and it's completely, at least it was for me, if you if you have brain rot, you look up a guide, and you're like, oh, here's every single Korok seed location on a map, and I'm going to sit here and hate myself for 200 yeah. hours doing that, <laughs> which is a mistake. But if you're, if you're just me, then you're like, every time I sat down to play that game, which I was doing in a structured Let's Play context, which has this pressure in the back of my mind of like, I have to do something interesting. I can't just like waste time wandering around and stare at walls like the way that normal gamers might do. I have to like do something. But like what I would literally do is like, I, I, like, I remember being in the desert and looking kind of like north-ish and seeing a weird series of tall ancient statues akin to like those, the big statue from Lord of the Rings. So that, but that's on both sides of that one like bay or whatever. A river 
and they're just kind of like the names of those statues and they're, and they're just kind of like there's like in the desert and they're leaning and they kind of look like they're pointing somewhere and you're just like i i'm just i just want to see what that what's up with that i'm just gonna go there and like over the and like you'll go adventuring like sincerely adventuring in a video game and you'll investigate the direction the stuff is going in and over the course of doing that you'll naturally deviate to like seven different things that you went to because you wanted to and like i would uh my arc of just checking out one thing would become like this big three hour multi-episode adventure of wanting to like check out all these different things that i just felt like seeing while also having kind of like a naturally paced series of like enemy encounters and day night cycles and blood moons while i was doing that and throughout that is a collection of just like so many korok locations that you're always curiously looking for them but you're but like there there there's so many of them that it's like clearly like you're meant to incidentally kind of discover them and be like oh shit i recognize this but obviously never find all of them because that would be insane and so like there was just like it's almost like this like uh, open world ADHD thing where you just like there's like you go there yeah. for one thing and you end up deviating to seven other things in the process of that while then re continually like reorienting back to your original task and just kind of having a great time doing that the whole time and like it's been like discourse to death but like it is so cool to me to the point where I'm kind of worried about how the change might uh dampen the new game it was so cool to me that you would just like they recontextualize the towers the like Altair makes a eagle noise and jumps into a bale of hay towers that would it's just not Altair that makes the noise it's an eagle yeah but <laughs> well it's a <laughs> we gotta, well, we gotta it's get a into whether or not it's a uh, what do you call it noise uh yeah the, the, diegetic like the diegetic <laughs> is, the, is the bird diegetic or not the uh yeah. <laughs> or is that a superpower <laughs> Like in Assassin's Creed, you would just climb a tower for a while and it was a climbing quote unquote puzzle where you held up for a long time, but sometimes you had to hold diagonal yeah. a bit and slightly it's find a better a path. Functional mechanic yeah. thing where it's like, oh, I, I can't look at the map. This is inconvenient. I'm going to climb up this tower now <laughs> to fill out yeah. my map. And like in Assassin's Creed, you you had a completely blurred out nothing map. And then every time you got a tower, a local circle of it got filled in. And then maybe yep. they would, and then the later games they'd populate it with too many icons and so on. And then immediately you just jump down because all the, the only, the only useful information as Altair, the, as the player was to look around and be like, ah, that sure is a historically accurate TM landscape. Anyway, yes. Eagle dive into the hay. <laughs> but when you get to the yep. top of a tower in Zelda, the part where the cutscene plays and then the the t local topography is added to the map that you already had access to anyway like your map already was complete it just adds topographic data but you already could navigate yep. via map the whole game the real goal is to look around with your actual human eyes spot things of interest that you actually have an interest at tele telescope at them and then put a beacon at them to be able to navigate them on ground and then that beacon is in the world so it's not a compass uh, it's not it's not a fallout compass line mm -hmm. and it's not a yeah. waypoint on your map it is a physical beam of light that you're pursuing in a way that encourages you to continue looking at the world and every time you're journeying towards one of those destinations you saw miles away from a, a tower you will inevitably discover like seven other things just because it's essentially like throwing you like they put so many spokes on that wheel that you're always going to be tearing your way through like an unscripted path through the jungle or whatever and be like oh shit there's a whole np there's a whole town over here there's an npc with this quest over here or a shrine or a korok and so on and like the way that all those things interacted was just very very engaging and it uh, the fact that i was doing yeah. things because i wanted to even even like in both cases it is just like there are there are gameplay elements on a map there are just tasks but like being the shifting into being self-driven instead of being like here's the endless checklist of things and the completionist percentage you're not you're now at 72.02 percent completionism only set only 30 more hours until you get the platinum trophy like the fact that yeah. people zero the fact that they zeroed in on achievements at the beginning of the xbox 360 era and then put those achievements incentive structures in the game itself as your implied yeah. <laughs> goal every second of gameplay ruined open world games so hard and so yeah. Breath of, and like tears of the kingdom is interesting so far because 
it takes the same world as Breath of the Wild and it has all these perks that I just talked about and then it layers new intriguing elements into that that are unexpected mm -hmm. because you're in this false sense of like this is a local familiar location from six years ago and then wild deviations exist because of what they've done with that game that I don't want to get into in detail at all but there are very yeah. cool discoveries about what they've actually done with the setting and then of course they've also now added the crazy building mechanics which means they've essentially done the le what was kind of least expected thing which was to go back to gta 3 and add the sandbox to the modern open world <laughs> games so now you have the sandbox that people liked in the first place and you have what made breath of the wild good and this is all without the going making the fall fallout i mean the far cry and the far cry and and uh assassin's creed pitfalls that made me so sad every time people were like oh yeah the best open world game horizon zero dawn ghost of tsushima <laughs> it's colorful and it has robot dragons and yeah the same and it's the same open world game you've been playing since assassin's creed 2 remember da vinci is he gay <laughs> <laughs> yeah so one of the things, I mean, it's interesting that you, you bring up a lot of this stuff in the context of Breath of the Wild, because what you described does mirror my experience with Breath of the Wild in a lot of ways, but deviates in how you ended up feeling about it. And this is this is where I will describe my thing with Breath of the Wild and the thing that kind of holds it back for me and the reason why I'm not slobbering to uh to dive onto tears of the kingdom uh so breath of the wild was really interesting for me because i have played many open world games and i've played every zelda game and everything that you said rings true it does a very good job of making you look at your actual map and understand your surroundings um and i was doing that as i played the game i didn't 100 percent it or anything like that but i did all the shrines and i did all the divine beasts and i did as many side quests as i could run into basically if content fell in front of me in in breath of the wild i did it what started to wear on me and what made the veneer of that game wear thin was I would so I'd have like a waypoint on my map, right? And I would be like, I'm going to go there and I'm going to check out this cool statue that was like pointing at this thing. And I'm going to see if there's something cool there. And I would go and I would go to do that. And then I would inevitably find a like, let's say like uh, I'm, I'm making an example up because I played Breath of the Wild six years ago, right? Exactly. Like when it first came out. So my, I, my I don't have anything so perfect. Vague. But uh, I would I would go to a, a little like dilapidated village and I would go in and I would see, oh, there's like a bunch of bacoblins there. And they're like they're they're They have a little base that they've set up. And it's it's uh, it looks like there's a big chest on top. Like, holy crap, this is like its own set piece. And I would methodically go through and destroy the whole base and get to the top and open the chest. And inside there would be 20 arrows when I already have in, an infinite amount of arrows available to me. So I'm like, okay, whatever, that's weird. It's just like, oh, it's like a nice little vignette, whatever. Cool little level design, I guess. And I would go back to going to what I was looking for, and I would find another interesting-looking, amazing, individually crafted set piece that looks like it's full of a mystery. And it would have a bunch of bacoblins in it that I would kill. And at the end, there would be a chest and there would maybe, if I'm really lucky, be a piece of equipment that I'm not going to use because it's useless and has worse stats than everything else and isn't really meaningful and doesn't look good. And unlike something like a... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the big comparison here because every video game comes down to it. It doesn't it didn't work for me in the same way that something like a Dark Souls works for me, because I was going to say, Souls, like, are you about to bring up Elden Ring? <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> Elden Ring, I could bring up because Elden Ring does this as well. But uh, I let's say in Elden Ring, I I go down a path and I end up in this weird town. And, yeah, it's just a place that's filled with enemies. And at the end, there's a piece of armor I pick up that I'm never going to wear. I read the item description on that armor and that item description gives me a better understanding of the world and gives me an idea of how these things fit in. And the, the fact that that thing is there tells its own story that enriches my world experience and serves as a reward on its own. 
in Breath of the Wild, the armor will be like fur warrior's armor. This is some warrior armor that is not lined with fur. And that's it. That's all you get. Yeah. And so my experience with Breath of the Wild was consistently going out of my way to explore and engage with these systems only to feel like the game doesn't actually really reward you and is hinging on this feeling of unending majesty that is actually extraordinarily shallow and extraordinarily cut and pasted just in a way that is possibly fresh in terms of like how it gets you to go and explore those places, but never really ever felt rewarding to me with few exceptions. Now, one of the exceptions, of course, are things like that big labyrinth that was really cool or uh, trying to puzzle solve how you you deal with the the legendary dragons that are flying around. I can't remember their names. Uh, or, of course, my favorite part of Breath of the Wild, the part that I wish the whole game was even tied aisle. Like I want I want a open world Zelda game that is as densely packed with that level of cool, unique interactive engagements that constantly ask you to figure out new ways to actually engage with the environment. But for the most part, my Breath of the Wild playthrough was a generally completionist playthrough where I never changed my approach to anything, never felt rewarded by doing anything, saw almost all of the content and realized most of the content kind of was the same content, just like fractaled into a million different vaguely variated circumstances that weren't actually they didn't actually stress my understanding of the world or my understanding of how I could approach the world. Um, and that sort of gets to the bigger thing, which is like, you know, you'll go on Twitter and you'll see people be like, did you know you can set grass on fire in Breath of the Wild and and squirrels will run up to it and try to get acorns out of the grass because they're hungry. This is a crazy life sim. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's like a cool I'm like, that's a cool animated thing that they programmed in. But like, what, what can you ever actually video? <laughs> yeah, like like what can you ever actually use this for in any meaningful way? This does not change your approach to the game. It's just a wacky thing you can do that like, yeah, is like fun for the sake of fun. But it, like, it's not like a meaningful, like profound Ludo narrative moment. It's just like. <laughs> yeah, the grass sets on fire. It's not actually going to help you very much. The squirrels running for their acorns aren't going to like distract a a Lionel for you and let you get a critical hit. Like you aren't rewarded for doing that. It's just a thing. So, uh, so that's, that's my disconnect with Breath of the Wild. And again, people in the comments are going to come after me. You can, you can post your angry engagement comments at patreon.com slash toasted ringtail. But uh, (laughs) I just, I, I I just have never connected with the profound degree of praise that Breath of the Wild has gotten and now Tears of the Kingdom is getting because, yes, it is a game full of possibility, but I feel like it just doesn't do a very good job of like rewarding those possibilities in a meaningful yeah. uh, way outside of simply the majesty of having a video game that you can play. And as someone who plays a lot of video games, that doesn't really do much for me. And again, I'm not saying Breath of the Wild is bad. It is my third favorite Zelda game. I have played every Zelda game. I really like Breath of the Wild. It, it I score it like two points above my average for most video games. I'm a very harsh critic and I, I you are a seven really... out of 10 breath of the wild reviewer. Damn, yes. Damn. That is, that is my, that is my <laughs> review score. When I played breath Six of the wild, 10, and I was reviewing video water. games. I gave it, I gave it a seven out of 10, which is two points higher than my average. Five is a good game. I recommend to people. I use the edge magazine scale. Breath wow. of the Wild was a seven. <laughs> I love that game. I think it is great. A seven out of 10 is a great game worth playing. Uh, but yeah, I give it a seven out of 10 and like, does it reach the heights of Majora's mask to me? Not even remotely. No Nintendo game ever has, but I really love it. So wait, it's it, just it's one of those wait, things is it actually, that is it that also struggles. my third favorite Zelda game? <laughs> oh wow! Uh, 
so yeah, it's just <laughs> it's it's just one of those things, you know. It's just one of those things where I I I, I struggle to relate to the very I don't want to even call it hyperbolic praise because I feel like people are very sincere when they love Breath of the Wild and they love Tears of the Kingdom. It's just it doesn't match with my reality of those games and i no matter how hard i try to understand that perspective i can't see the world that the people who love that game see even from a like design standpoint it's very hard for me to understand putting my like emotional personal things i like in a video game stuff aside breath of the wild just doesn't i there's something about it that i just don't see how people don't see those things in other games i guess right. is like the I mean, best way to describe it part of the plot twist is that zelda as a franchise has especially the 3d ones uh have like yep gaping flaws and are like really oh, interesting completely. flawed in a lot of cases like it's actually yes it's the the 2d games which i like less are more consistently uh like harder to criticize our, our, on some levels but the uh oh completely yeah but I, they but are I, like they are very refined design spaces yeah. <laughs> in but the, three, the 2d like, space like, yeah like, like my favorite zelda games i think in order probably are like majora's mask twilight princess then breath of the wild and twilight princess has the yep. fucking garbage ass wolf mechanics which like i love yeah. wolf link as a character design and i especially love his stupid awu music instrument where he makes stupid stupid noises <laughs> like <laughs> it's it's frustrating how like uh subjective it can feel to try to nail down how to play it but it's hilarious to what it's happening uh but like that fucking like every second of wolf link gameplay is basically awful and one of the worst things they do yep. is make it so that you turn into Wolf Link and then you have to find like a Banjo Kazooie jump pad, like, oh, hi. Uh, yeah. But it's invisible <laughs> and unlabeled. It's like, oh, this random chunk of rock over here is a spot where Minda will get a jump prompt. And you have to know that somehow in order to continue the game is like incredibly garbage. What? Why would you do this to me? Moments. Uh, and like, yeah, Breath of the Wild is a game that nailed down intrinsic motivation without actually being able to capitalize on those with extrinsic rewards. Like, it, especially since there isn't necessarily a, a, an interest in having extreme world building and lore, you're not going to generally yep. be rewarded with answers or context when you get to these really specific places. And, and, and the game has this very flat basically randomized loot system that never can build anywhere and also everything breaks for all the, all the time except for armor so it has it struggles to go anywhere with that stuff and on some level this is a problem shared across the board in that uh like elden ring was a game that yes you can read descriptions on the items but like a very common complaint was the fact that like you get all these uh whenever you do find a cool cave or a dungeon they start to relatively quickly become repetitive and the rewards are like, oh, wow. It's a spell for one of the seven schools of sorcery that you don't use. <laughs> so it's yeah. literally unusable in this playthrough. And that was the reward for beating this this boss. And so like in Elden Ring, the reward and the, and the real reason that would determine whether or not you want to do these dungeons is the actual desire to do this random cave and fight the random boss at the end and and find out what kind of thing was there and yep. the sort of like self-contradictory loop in your brain would be the fact that like you would start realizing that you kind of ran out of variability and you're gonna fight another tree nut like testicle <laughs> root thing or you're gonna fight another uh yeah or you're gonna fight another cat robot and it's going to just be the same things again and yet you keep doing it and there's the question of how hard you keep committing to that and to some extent that it kind of happened in breath of the wild because at some point the game can't reward you and that's a thing that is an interesting problem to have because the specific thing i compliment both of those franchises for arguably franchises uh for for before they were open world games was how good they were at structured rewards like you pointed yeah. out the uh the item descriptions and being an addition to the lore on like unique weapons and stuff like that and that's being and that being that that yeah, potentially like giving you some sort sting. of incentive yeah like it, it potentially curbs the sting of the fact that you got a, a great site that's useless to you and also arguably in most dark souls build in dark souls runs you usually use like one or two weapons in the entire run arguably because you find yeah the thing that works for your spec and then 
a thing that I, th I see as a flaw in Dark Souls is that they they gate progress via an upgrade currency that is tiered based on locations in the game to give it a power curve. Yeah. But there's a scarcity to those items that makes it very difficult to upgrade any alternate weapons. So the gameplay variability is so narrow from in each playthrough because you literally cannot afford to make alternate weapons for your build anyway. Yeah, uh, exactly. You, but, it makes you specialize very early, very quickly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but one of the 75 reasons why Dark Souls 2 is my favorite is that it has it, it, they they took what was also also good about Zelda, which was having unique rewards throughout the game that incentivized exploration and completionism and your natural curiosity. That was already a thing that the game was doing well. And this is also why yep. Twilight Princess HD is a is a bad update on this level and frustrating <laughs> is that uh zelda has heart pieces and they have a few other things too they have uh, there's there's a few bottles each playthrough and a few other upgrades but they have permanent structured upgrades that are scattered throughout the game that incentivize you to carefully explore the world and that is an incredibly fantastic concrete reason to be curious and it's why it was it stung so hard that Zelda, that Twilight Princess HD had a bunch of very specific explorable chests. Like there's a part where you're, there's like a funnel of water coming downward at you, and it's like a big kind of struggle to like go up this like what's essentially a spiral staircase of 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 river that's going downhill. And your reward for getting to the top is a Miiverse stamp that you can't use anymore because the Miiverse is down, but also it wasn't yeah. a good reward even when the Miiverse existed. And there's 50 of those in that game. There's 50 Miiverse stamps where there should be like heart pieces or a bomb bag or some kind of permanent upgrade that felt good. And on a regular basis, like the heart pieces actually get like segmented off to shitty little side areas that are like not that interesting of a secret and the bigger secrets are given to the Miiverse stamps and that's such a horrible choice but the rest of the franchise is really good about that kind of reward and Dark Souls 2 what they did is they took the Estus flask and they iterated on it where instead of having the Dark Souls 1 system where you have five flasks and then when you kindle bonfires you get 10 15 etc uh they made it so there are two separate kinds of heart pieces one that makes your Estus Flask increase in number and one that inc makes yep. it increase in healing. And so over the course of the playthrough, you can collect a really large number of major upgrades and, the, and those are hidden in the environment to, in to encourage Zelda style exploration. And that's why Dark Souls 2 is the best Dark Souls fucking you can't you can't you ever trick me. Uh, <laughs> it's so good. It's such a good system. Uh, it is. How dare it is. people not pay attention to how good this is i think elden ring brought it back because it was perfect uh but <laughs> yeah i think i think the fact that elden ring is very much uh, dark souls 2 2 is yes. like a pretty strong testament to how so good dark souls 2 is but uh but yeah i mean like i i definitely hear what you're what you're saying with that and i i agree with a lot of it and like especially when it comes to like upgrades like i don't think yeah. that I think everyone will agree, like especially the whole Soul series, like the way that it does upgrade progression in general is pretty, pretty much like the worst part about those games. So it's it's kind of interesting to to you know fixate on that and see that in context to like what Zelda does well and and how it does it. And again, I I want to be very clear: me bringing up something like Elden Ring or Dark Souls is not actually to compare them. It was more just to to make a explanation of like why i think layered because that, that's what this conversation is actually about it's, it's, it's like, talking about the specific structures and incentives and mechanics yeah like uh, la in, layered like, vacuum, reward systems yeah exactly it's like this idea of like what what did what would i need for breath of the wild to like hit me the same way the open worlds i like did yeah. and it's like i need a layered like multi-layered complex system that isn't just a system to be a system. It's a system that interacts with other systems ludonarratively. And I just, I didn't feel like those games had that. Whereas like, even again, just pulling another example in like Red Dead Redemption 2 is a, an open world that feels very fulfilling to engage with because every single system is tied into another system that has ludonarrative meaning and value. So like when you go out to hunt and find a cool gun or like, 
encounter an interesting random event in the world like that changes your narrative experience with that game in a way that is concretely meaningful and rewardingly tangible you do a legendary hunt you unlock different things from that and it it incentivizes you to want to go out and do more of them uh you know stuff like that that i think you know sets that game apart compared to like a gta game where it's like you know i found i found a ufo in the mountains woo like you know like there's just like nothing there i don't think breath of the wild is that bad or anything like that uh you know like like your standard gta 3 which to add even more credibility to this this past year i replayed all of the gta games up through gta 5 i did not play gta 5 i played gta 1 all the way up through 4 so i have a very strong understanding of how gta's open world works and i do not like them at all Um, (laughs) you didn't like gta 2 uh gta 2 is fine i don't think it's like incredible uh i it's fine i I like the stories of those games (laughs) i like the stories of those games they're interesting it's just like one credit for playing gta 2 yeah we all Colonel and i are are some of the few people probably who have in modern times (laughs) i have never played gta 1 or 2 i played gta chinatown wars on the ds I never Which played was the like DS the return game. to that format, I arguably, maybe, but I don't. PC. I didn't play very much of it because no, it was no, very it's, fun. I don't think they're the same. I I have the PlayStation disc for GTA One and Two, and then I bought three secondhand from a guy who like didn't like GTA. He like got it for <laughs> yeah. Christmas or something, and he was like, "This game sucks. It's too big." And I was like, "Uh." Uh, oh, okay i'll take that off your hands bud that sucks like <laughs> i just always think about yeah. the fact that i have a copy i don't remember if it was gta 1 or 2 but i have a copy of one of the original gta's and the whole novelty was the fact that i bought it at a thrift store called the u-turn for jesus because it was yeah, a thrift store incredible. you could only access via a u-turn and it was a goofy ass but it's just such a heavily christian themed uh thrift store that sold gta to me <laughs> and i'm like i have to buy this just on principle because it's very funny that, that i could buy a gta here and so i have yep. one of the early gta's that i've never played still but, but yeah, yeah <laughs> i don't know it's just but it's just, just I think GTA one and like, were, was, were different games but it felt yes very different i think it is very interesting that on Whoa. top of like the game that people often criticize uh, that often is praised including me uh for being like a revitalization of the modern open world like genre and i was like keeping an eye i was like specifically watching like waiting for other companies to like learn lessons from and iterate on and improve on breath of the wild's formula instead of still making horizon zero dawn which is what actually happened uh they just they completely ignore breath of the wild basically uh yeah but that game itself has a a, a a an indictment of itself in itself yes because as you said like so many people's favorite part of that entire game is even tied isle which specifically feels like a mod that a user made to fix yes. breath of the wild in breath of the wild because yes, <laughs> it, it, it zeroed in on Breath of the Wild's most interesting mechanics and how they're ruined by the open world. So it's a criticism of open world games as a concept, essentially. Because, yeah, you get to that island, and for those that don't know, you get to know an island in Breath of the Wild, and you lose everything. The moment you get there, you have no inventory. So you have to, it, on this structured island that has a particular goal, you have to successfully get equipment and crafting resources and healing items from the land and loot and enemies from scratch essentially in order to like sort of have a little power curve and climb up and defeat this little structured encounter and this was so specifically obviously good that the first dlc for this game was a gauntlet that was entirely this idea where you start the entire deal it's like a series of survival style floors to solve that you have to start with zero equipment and solve all the all your way up and tears the kingdom itself some of its shrines throw you in and take all your stuff away and say solve this shrine because they are tiny little eventides like that's so clearly a great idea and all of breath of the wild constantly struggles with the fact that like they did one thing which is they give you an inventory of weapons and stuff that breaks and constantly refreshes and you can hold so much but then they let you upgrade how many you could hold so you can increase your inventory in those slots and then they also uh you have an infinite inventory for like apples and shit like that. So yeah. there is no difficulty curve essentially in, in Zelda. 
at the beginning of the game, you get one shot by a blue bow cop, and you're like, damn, this game's edgy. Uh, but, yeah. at, but the moment you get six hearts or something, you're like, oh, I have infinite healing items for the rest of this game, and this will never actually be hard, basically. I just will get blindsided by giant spikes of damage, but I'll also be able to fix it instantly. Uh, yep. Culminating in me running up Death Mountain while literally on fire and just buying and, and then finding uh, fire resistant stuff inside of the mountain instead of actually doing the smart thing of finding out how to be resistant to fire before I went up there. I just ran yep. up the entire mountain burning and screaming <laughs> and healing myself infinitely. <laughs> uh, and like that's 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 very much as a thing like the game, the game, not all the mechanics of the game agree with its own open world philosophy and several of them benefit specifically from being in a more structured zelda style playthrough <laughs> to the point where you could take a lot of what breath of the wild does turn it into a linear single player i don't know why i said that that way specifically but turn it turn it into an old school uh zelda campaign and it would work better <laughs> in that structure yeah. than it does yeah. as a as a big blobby open world that has so little structure that you can just go anywhere with with 500 meat pies yeah, ah, but well, that's, that's what I that happens about. to every open world. Yeah, like yeah New Vegas it does. It's 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 a sure. like that. It is. It is. Arguably. Oh, no, well, not. I. I. I'm being unfair. Not every open world. There's some open, like for example, Pathologic. It doesn't. That doesn't apply. There are but, some open worlds that are But it's that interesting because the moment you add incentive structures like Pathologic does to that world design, it's immediately debatable whether that counts as open world anymore. Because the freedom is intrinsic to the genre. Because it puts a limit on you. you yeah, know, I see. Yeah. The it's moment interesting open world there game too. plays like Pathologic, it's extremely questionable whether we can still call it that is the issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think about it with Breath of the Wild too. Like, honestly, and this is me just spitballing. Like, I'm sure mods like this exist. But, like, again, I when I played Breath of the Wild, I played it on, on the Wii U because it's a Wii U game. And I played it on hero mode with all of the HUD elements turned as far off as I could make them. Uh, and that was great. That was a great way to play that game. I think it actively made it better. The only way I want like a mod that gives me an inventory limit and like a weight limit. Like I want to have to deal with that in that game because I think about how interesting it would be if I could only carry three weapons at a time. And I have to deal with degradation. Oh, yeah. Because imagine if I'm fighting a Lionel and my sword breaks and I use a spear and I do something crafty and I like climb onto a ledge and then throw the spear at him and get damage. And then, you know, I have all I have left is like a stick and my bow and arrow. So I actually have to engage in combat in an interesting way. And like. So then I have to lure him over to some Bacoblin so that I can kill a Bacoblin in time to grab its spear to then parry the Lionel and like actually d deal with that. Like that would be cool. I just I it's just weird to me because then I turn like that idea sounds so engaging and so exciting because it does stress what a lot of people claim to love about Breath of the Wild, which is that it has this really emergent gameplay stuff and like all these cool systems that interact. But then I go on Twitter and I see these same people being like, Breath of the Wild combat's so cool. You can do so many freeform things. And then like I look at their Twitters and they're like, weapon degradation is bad. I want infinite <laughs> item use. And I'm like, how is this? Like you, you are not making a cohesive argument here. Like, no. what are you talking about? The very thing that you are praising would be better if you just... <laughs> if you if you were limited by it like it's it's just weird it's just a weird dissonance to me that i don't fully understand a lot of it is uncritical brand loyalty like it is people of just i mean like, that's just zelda this game is good Nintendo and i'm hyped about it and i will retroactively try to fit arguments <laughs> to my emotions instead of actually structuring this and then you read what they're saying you're like this doesn't this is incoherent. This doesn't make sense uh, at all but no, I, had, I had the exact <laughs> same thought while i was monologuing for way too long where i was like what if Breath of the Wild had like fucking Resident Evil ones inventory? Oh, don't even I don't like, even fucking talk to me. I am like I am physically quivering at the thought of a six item talking. inventory now in talking. Breath of the Wild. Or just just the idea of Breath of the Wild having Resident Evil's like resource management and inventory management and like that limitation oh. would be so engaging that it's like ah. But what I what I do what I will get into a little bit is that Tears of the Kingdom pulls kind of a baller fucking move uh which is mm -hmm. that they took all this criticism about the weapon degradation system and they're like 
no you're wrong but they also didn't just That's keep good. the same system so minor spoilers for tears of the kingdom but what they did is that the corruption that happened to the kingdom that explains every change that happened in in its entirety basically uh it corrupted every weapon ever so every weapon okay. is now a rusty piece of shit garbage boy everything's more degraded and shittier than ever before <laughs> every single weapon is trash and fuck you and what they did now is uh there are uh you can use stuff like a Lizalfos horn and stuff like that to like imbue weapons so you you fight monsters carve chunks off of them and then you like you like craft these little nightmare amalgam weapons like i found a cool rock and i put it on the end of my sword and i'm using this shitty rusty sword to beat people with this cool rock and that's the new weapon system <laughs> and so at their core they're all still instantly degradable nightmare uh disposable weapons but also you're even more disposable than ever before and that you're like tying garbage to them to make them cooler for five minutes to then beat people with and then they break yeah. it's fucking hilarious <laughs> you look like a you just look like link the like link is homeless now yeah the <laughs> it's, murder it's, murder it's quite vagrant the link <laughs> like the first thing you the first incredibly stupid thing the game teaches you to do is to is to attach a rock to your shield so your shield is a little buckler with a boulder sticking out of it and that's your shield at the beginning near the beginning of the game you're like oh my yeah. god yeah. And, and like I'm sure I'm sure that every like all of the things that are you're saying about this sound sound great to me and I'm sure that I will like Tears of the Kingdom when I eventually play it. It's just I I just am not I don't know if I'm ready yet. Like personally spiritually see, speaking, I I have I have some healing I need to do before I jump into Tears of the Kingdom because yeah. cause because Breath Twitter, of the Wild is, Twitter causes is, toaster emotional damage. Yeah, there's there's two things in life that physically pain me um, that that uh, that attack my brain cells and drill holes into my brain matter. And the first one is uh, Twitter discourse. And the second is Overwatch 2, <laughs> which was our next topic. <laughs> we but the uh, yeah, I'm just like poor toaster. You're opting into having a Twitch and a YouTube where as you grow, every opinion you have will have the dumbest counter arguments all the time. Like I deal with this every day. Like when you were like, no one would disagree that that's a cool system or that's a bad system earlier. I forget what it was. I'm like, you would be fucking shocked. <laughs> Cause oh, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I like to be optimistic, right? I just want to, I hope that people are smarter than they are and they're not. And I'm forever disappointed by it. But I mean, it's fine. If you, if you disagree with me, comment on the video and press that dislike button and yeah. super chat $10 and we'll read it and then not respond to it. Interact as much as possible with this opinion you don't like, please. Oh. You can complain directly to me at patreon.com slash <laughs> engagement. 